if you've been in a soup all your life, yeah. you more or less know the taste of it. Every Friday, everyone just like at three o'clock stops working and they eat cake, which is bizarre to me because I've never seen that happen in an office before. But they have their weird stuff as well. For instance, they have no proximity borders whatsoever. So standing at the coffee machine in the morning, I mean, they're just standing almost, you know, on you. <laughs> the voices of current and former trainees. From DFDS, I'm Julie Broberg, and this is The Ripple Effect. Okay, are you ready? Or, uh, did I say training grades? You got that. Sorry. Why? Not? Right, we are rolling, right? It's on tape now. <laughs> Exploring the people and maritime stories that make a difference. And I'm Jason Luke, the co-host of this branded podcast from DFDS. In this four-part miniseries, we will focus on the DFDS trainee program. This is episode three, Culture Shock. If you haven't listened to our previous two episodes and gotten to know our five trainees, you should definitely go back and have a listen. If you've been in a soup all your life, yeah. you more or less know the taste of it. That was Armin from Lithuania. He's one of our former trainees, and he's now employed by DFDS. But wait a minute, let's hear that again. We'll have to hear that again. <laughs> that is like the most zen-like quote I've ever heard. Uh, let's, let's run that once again. If you've been in a soup all your life, yeah. you more or less know the taste of it. It's brilliant. But what does it even I mean? Think he, I think he means that... I think it's a really great metaphor for those cultural differences, right? I mean... <laughs> it's a good headliner because this episode is all about some of the cultural oddities that people come across when they suddenly find themselves in a new location. Yeah, and the we both actually are living outside of our native country, and yeah. so we've experienced it ourselves. You're from the States. Yeah, and, and so are you, actually. <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> but you came when you were very small, didn't I was you? four and a half, yeah, starting in kindergarten. The garden. All I remember was that I had a great time with other kids, only later realizing the fact that I probably didn't speak Danish and they probably didn't speak English. You know, the rest is history. But it probably didn't go that easy for you, did it? No, it didn't. I was I was a bit older than that when I came. You're an adult. Uh, <laughs> I was an adult, and uh, and I came for love. Uh, so so I ended up um, thinking, well, if I'm going to stay and and be with this person, which I did stay, and mm -hmm. I am with that person, um, I I need to learn the language. So one of the first things I did was was go study. I spent the first seven months studying Danish, um, kind of intensively, actually. It was fun. It was good, and I really think it was a great way for me to begin speaking Danish and understanding Danish and settling in. You're going to a new place and you're just going to have to learn something. Yeah. You might only be going there for a year, yeah. you know, uh, like the trainees, they will be in a location for one year only unless right. they end up staying there. Like Armin, that's what he's talking about. He wanted to stay abroad and going to a new place, you will have to learn just a little bit about the local. Yeah, about the locals, whether it's language or what they eat or how they behave in the workplace, what mm. they do outside of work. And there may be different takes on Christmas, birthdays, you know, all the things that go on in people's lives that you don't necessarily know on beforehand. And which aren't really in any of the guidebooks. When I first came to Denmark, someone gave me the Xenophobes Guide to the Danes, and that did actually help me quite a bit. <laughs> there were a lot of funny stories in it. Yeah, and let's get to those funny stories. With us is Gonzalo. So, uh, Gonzalo, you are from a country where people don't traditionally speak a lot of English. Uh, well, I did my university in England, so it's good. I, I, I know how British people speak, so I understand how, I mean, I understand everything when they speak, right? Yeah. But when I moved to Belfast, that's a completely different league. Like that's uh, like the worst accent I have ever heard. Have you, then you it's have so not hard. been to Glasgow. Yeah. Yeah. At Glasgow. I've yeah. never I've never been in Glasgow, but oh, yeah. I could bet I could bet now that Belfast is even worse. It, it was really? terrible. Okay. Oh my god. But, um, okay. So I remember like the first the first the first day I was there. And I was just looking at, uh, looking at everyone, like, what are they talking about? And this uh, person came to me and he told me, like, yeah, Gonzalo, what's the crack? And I was just thinking, like, 
what is this guy telling to me? Like, I didn't know what to ask for, but he was only asking me, like, how are you doing? And I was like, yeah, well, sorry, but I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> but, yeah. It took me, it took, it took me just like, yeah, just like a month or a month and a half to get used to the way that you speak, so. Elizabeth, you're Norwegian. And Danish and Norwegian, they're basically the same, right? <laughs> Must have been yeah. easy. When I came there and I have a fairly strong dialect, uh, I realized that I had to switch. Uh, it took some time, but I had to sort of Danishify my language yeah, yeah. in order yeah, to yeah, survive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. After fixing up your dialect, did you encounter any other linguistic oddities? Yeah. What's the strangest thing that you learned? Oh, it's definitely the Danish number system. Ah, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> number system? The number system is so weird. Yeah. Oh, like... Uh, yeah, with when the backwards number thing. But but German has three. that, too. If you studied in Berlin, didn't you encounter it there? It's not quite the same, but, no, no, but, no, the, no, no, but they're no, in the wrong it's order. it's still dial, dial sex issues. Yeah, that's true. It's, okay. not, it's not completely made up weird sets of 20. Yeah, sex minus, tests yeah, yeah. and shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> and also it was so it was so difficult because when I was living and working in Denmark there are so many calls where you called because you just want to check on numbers oh instance, no a trailer a container number <laughs> and then you if you had you know a customer and they would be like yes the the number is uh, DHZB uh, <laughs> and you have to think about those numbers yeah so we're going to do this number by number <laughs> my brain has never worked so hard before sometimes with the numbers and i remember one of the customers actually saying you should go and learn the numbers at a school somewhere <laughs> and then i was just thinking okay so this is this is nice. Uh, I'm not really motivated right now to perhaps give you the best customer service, but no. I have to. <laughs> but, <laughs> so eventually I learned it, but it was yeah. actually a real, it was a real struggle to learn it. And it was probably some weird local <laughs> Jutland accent. Also. Yeah, of course. It's funny because now that I'm working here in Flodingen, I actually have a Danish boss. So when I met him, uh, I was speaking with him in a bit of my weird Norwegian Danish. Mm-hmm. And he was like, that's weird. That's a Norwegian with a Jutland accent on the Danish. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> and I was like, this is me. Hello. <laughs> okay, so Gonzalo, uh, evidently you also had some challenges with the local accent. Tell us about it. I had to do this, uh, I had to do every morning. They gave me like this, uh, it was like six customers and we all have like this uh, conference call in the morning, right? Okay. So I was the person in charge of giving the DFDS speech. <laughs> so they were all from the UK. So imagine it was morning, I was alone in my department. <laughs> so I said like, yeah, I have, to, I have to do the call, I have to do it. So I was convinced I, I would do it very well. So I just uh, took the uh, call and I just give the my speech or whatever I had prepared. Everyone say yes until one person says like, yeah, please the FDS. And he asked like this, I mean like a very long question. Obviously I didn't understand anything. <laughs> so he, I was like, yeah, sorry, but I don't understand. And just saying like, yeah, my phone doesn't work very well and please just write an email. So that was uh, funny as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Good, good problem it's, solving, uh, actually. Really yeah. good problem solving there. <laughs> Apart from the obvious language difficulties, did you have any other culture shock? Elizabeth. You had some cultural issues, which I didn't knew were there. For instance, the obsessiveness with cakes in the office. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've never had so much cake before in my life as I did that year. I mean, were there were there rules around the cake? Of course, there there is a regime. I mean, I've heard of other friends of mine working abroad also in Denmark, and they have the same experience with this cake uh, mania, basically. But yeah, we had, for instance, oh, you went on holiday, bring a cake. Yes. Uh, you yeah. bought a car, bring a cake. Yes. Uh, you arrived late today, bring, bring a, a cake. cake. <laughs> yeah, and I and I failed actually the first week I was there because somebody brought a cake on a Friday and I thought, oh, maybe it's just like Cake Friday. That I can sort of understand. So the next week after, I brought some cakes and everybody was like, why did you bring cake? <laughs> 
Are they, <laughs> they weren't they, grateful or what? <laughs> yeah, of course they were grateful. I brought them cake. They were also questioning why. And then there were all these invisible rules to me that I learned, obviously. Okay, cake mania. Maria, do you have anything for the cakewalk? Yeah, about the cake, I will agree with Elizabeth <laughs> on that one. But I think, but I think it's in all of the offices. It doesn't have to do with a specific culture. You think it's just uh, DFTS? Yeah, it's cake. <laughs> so, <laughs> Masola, what's the cake scene like in Gothenburg? I think, like when I first came, every Friday is like speaker Friday, so like everyone just like at three o'clock stops working and goes to take like a cup of coffee, and like they eat cake, which is bizarre to me because I've never seen that happen in an office before. But are there any unspoken cultural rules about the cake? Yeah. Like, don't have the last slice, just leave it there. What? What a waste. I think the last piece of anything is just left. No one no one eats it. No one dares to know. take the last piece. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cake cultures, yeah. If I see cake uh, somewhere, then I'll. Uh, it's the last slice. You know, the, no one having that. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah. I think the Danes don't hold back from that. We we're good at eating the last of it. Yeah, well, we. So, I'm yeah. not. I say we as if I'm Danish. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I've been here so long. Okay, now, after the break, we will be continuing with a little more about the cultural differences and oddities that occur when working abroad. Stay with us. I'm not so sure this is a good idea. Seeing more of me? No. Swimming in the sea on a match morning is much different in Spain. I'm Lithuanian. I've done it for years, but I only do it in March to October. Talking of March, the deadline for the traineeship is at the end of it. The form is online. Do you want to come around at my place tonight and help? I'll do some supper. Super supper. I could do with some super soup right now. It's freezing. Are you a man or a mouse? I'm a man. Last one in the war is a sissy. <laughs> How about you? Move your boundaries, move your life, move your career. Go to dfds.com slash trainee, but do so by March 30th. And we're back again. Now with us is Elizabeth, who will entertain us with more tales about her cultural struggles. The cultural struggle is real, but it's also a fascinating one, I guess. (laughs) You've told us a lot of tales of your time in Denmark, but what about now? But I really enjoy it here now. Holland is nice. People here are nice. Uh, I think they are really easygoing and nice to work with. They speak frankly. So it's a very comfortable way of working, I think, uh, around the Mm -hmm. But they have their weird stuff as well as the Danish. For instance, they have no proximity borders whatsoever. So standing at the coffee machine in the morning, I mean, they're just standing almost, you know. There's close to all of you. Yeah, but it's funny because, I mean, I have this uh, mantra that it's always nice to be a minority at one point in your life because it gives you some perspective. (laughs) So I wasn't even aware that I had a sort of personal space that I I needed when, you know, I get my coffee every morning. But obviously I do. And speaking of things that you weren't even aware could be an issue, Gonzalo also had a clash of cultures during his first days in Kiel. Yeah, well, it's just like a, such a cultural shock, right? Like they do some things here I don't, and like so many things they do I'm not used to. Like what? Give us some examples. Like everything has to be tidy. Everything needs to be super clean, like on the table. For uh, yeah, when you go home, your table needs to be completely clean. And yeah, if you forget a cup or if you forget a glass of water. It's not good. Like, you're going to have to clean it right now. Otherwise, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They will clean it for you, but they will tell you after. Like, yeah. 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 Bicycle, it's good fun. It's, uh, you just learn from different uh, cultures, like the way they behave and the way they do it. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah, but, but I, I can say uh, clearly and uh, from my heart, uh, Gonzalo, that uh, you are definitely forgiven uh, for this uh, coffee cup. Incident, yes. And uh, between us, uh, I also sometimes forget my uh, bottle of water on the table when I go for a weekend. Uh, but we are foreigners in Germany, you and I, uh, and uh, Ordnung muss sein. Okay, so that was Jakob Andersen again. You met him briefly in the previous episode, and he's the root director in Kiel. And as a Dane in Germany, he fully understands that the cultural struggle is real. 
But that's, people will not tell you that sort of thing. Like, I mean, that's Alicia again. It's just because it's so, it's so normal no, it's for them. It's not in the guidebooks, yeah, right? It's so book. normal you don't think about it. Yeah, and every time I go in Denmark, it's the same. I'm like, okay, what the f is this thing? <laughs> or, I'm. Yeah. But I can also just mention where you see actual cultural differences at work because yep. my perception of the Danes are that they will go into conflict if they can. Oh, <laughs> that's my Sometimes. goodness. Really? Oh, wow. I wouldn't have thought that yeah. about the Danes. Because I think they are so shy of conflict. It drives me crazy. Okay, but this is because I'm from an even more shy country. <laughs> the thing was that, for instance, if I called the customer to tell them that we had, for instance, a container that we sadly did not ship because we forgot it, because it wasn't booked. I mean, mm -hmm. those things sadly happen. I would love to say in DFDF yeah, that never happens, but <laughs> it sometimes happens. And if you would call the customer, they would be often very angry and just giving you the full verbal uh, treatment <laughs> oh. that they felt that you needed. Wow. And, and you were a bit sort of pissed yourself because why do we let that thing happen? And then you would maybe call the colleagues uh, at another office, for instance, in England. It was so nice because if I called them and I said, I'm sorry, but now you made this mistake. Why? And blah, blah. It would always be so nice because they would be just, oh, that's fine. Okay. Thank you so much for calling. I was like, I just <laughs> gave it to you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you're still just being so nice. After the break, we'll be back with some seasonal cheer. So stay with us. Wow, those breasts look much smaller than you said. You know, it's the way they pack them. The secret with duck is to cook starting with a cold pan. So you think you'll be good looking after yourself in some foreign ports for two years? There's a lot of challenges. Culture, new work patterns, new responsibilities, and a new language. But the ad said that good English was a fundamental starting point. Of course, it's the language of the sea, commerce, but I'm sure I can survive. If I don't know the Norwegian for duck, I can just point. Okay, I'll log on so you can apply. What's your password? Quack, quack. <laughs> They're gonna love you. Welcome back. One last thing our trainees in the UK noticed was that people are crazy. For Christmas, were there some? Have there been some surprises or like the Christmas craziness in the UK that is going on right now? Yeah, is there I wasn't Christmas expecting craziness? that. Tell us about that. What what is that? that what is the it, Christmas yeah. craziness? I mean, they've been talking about Christmas all day, all the time since a month or something, <laughs> which is okay. I feel like since I'm here, they've been talking about Christmas so since first of September. <laughs> they're like, "Hey, what am I gonna go for Christmas? What am I gonna wear? What am I?" And I'm like, "Oh, I don't know." <laughs> Okay. Um, Christmas wow. is not such, such a big thing in Belgium, so yeah, no. that has been quite interesting and funny to see. I was I, I was now impressed by the Irish people how much they love Christmas, so it was a big shock for me okay. uh, because they, they really like it. They 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 are going all the Christmas way as much as they can. Like, so like, that was, like how does that, that how does that look? Difference. It looks like a lot of presents, a lot of going out, a lot of shopping, a lot of food. So mm -hmm. lot, yeah, everything, but in in a much bigger version of it. From Christmas to cakes and personal space, there are all kinds of aspects to culture shock, but you can always get through it with a bit of laughter. That's it from the trainees for now. It seems like the perfect time to turn it over to Dorda from HR, who will answer a couple of your burning questions. What's the ideal candidate? Um, I think that uh, some of the aspects that you need to have as a DFTS trainee is that you need to be open-minded and flexible. And, and why am I saying that is because you will be working with, with a lot of different cultures. You will rotate between departments. You will rotate between countries as well. So you need to be, um, to be open-minded towards working with other people with the different mindsets than you have. Um, I think that's a, that's a really important asset to have. You need to be a little bit courageous as well to step out of your comfort zone and uh, live in a completely new city, a new country with foreign people around you, that people that you don't know you may need to step up to, to in order to get to know them. So uh, a little bit of proactiveness uh, is, uh, is also what we're looking for. 
Dordo will be answering frequently asked questions in every episode, so if you didn't get an answer to your question, tune in next time. You can also write to us at social at dfts.com. That's social, S-O-C-I-A-L, at dfts.com. And we'll try to include your question in a future episode. If you've been in a soup all your life, you more or less know the taste of it. We just had to close off with that great quote from Armin again. He's one of our former trainees who now works for DFDS. And that's the topic of our next episode, making a career with us after the traineeship is over. After a number of years abroad, we asked Armin where he considers home to be. I don't know where home is. I think for me, it's all of Europe because I've been living here, here and here. And I have so many friends from uh, all over the world that I don't think that I have a nationality anymore. It's like <laughs> just European in general. Just a human being in this. Yeah, well, the, a, 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 mix, a mix of Europe. Uh, so uh, that's why I would say European because I've experienced quite a few cultures and it's just a mix of everything or maybe a hybrid. Okay, that pretty much wraps it up for this episode. Be sure to listen in on our next episode, which is out in two weeks from now. So, to be sure you don't miss out, subscribe to The Ripple Effect on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. And please do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find us. The Ripple Effect is produced by me, Julie Broberg, with story help from Richard Lightbody. Recorded and edited by Jason Luke at Mastertone Studio in beautiful downtown Copenhagen. Ad voices by Agna and Antonio Garcia. The music was by Morten Torhaug from Car Park North and Frank Hessenstrom and original music by me, Jason Luke. Thank you to our trainees Maria and Agnostu, Elizabeth Andreasen, Gonzalo Parente, Busola Adiaga, and Alicia Chevalier for sharing your experiences with us. A special thanks to Christina Johannesson. Reike Kransu is like a warm breeze on a tropical beach. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening in. <laughs>